Okay, Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Khair. Good evening. My name is Ibrahim Smeh. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live to our international audience from the Farah Medical Campus in Amman, Jordan. The topic for tonight will be about hepatitis disease, and we'll concentrate on the central nervous system infection. Hepatitis disease is rare in developed countries, but it is a considerable health problem in endemic areas. And when we say endemic in Asia, Middle East, Arab countries, Turkey, Europe, Eastern Europe. Australia and New Zealand, Latin America, because of the sheep and uh, cows there. So in the Mediterranean, Turkey, Greece, Spain, France, Italy, in the Middle East, Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, Canfteria, Egypt, and Libya. <coughs> Latin America, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. So this is the universal burden of the hydatic disease. The dark color means that it is highly endemic. The lighter is endemic, the white is almost uh, does not exist. The reason is the slaughtering in the slaughterhouse. This is what should be done to keep the clean atmosphere for uh, these things. But in the Arab countries in the Middle East, especially in the Eid of Sacrifice, Either Adha, livestock is slaughtered without any supervision in the streets. And this drives me crazy every year, trying to change this concept. And it is a pity that children and young adults are the ones who are affected. That's because of stray dogs, because of farming, livestock, and poor sanitary regulations. Forgive me for the images that I'm going to see. This is reality. Each and every one of you see this in our streets, in the streets of Pakistan, in Turkey, in Yemen, and the Middle East in general. People slaughtered in the streets, and they are proud of it, in the name of religion. This is a true picture from Egypt. Look at this, blood and everything in the streets. Look at this picture. And this is from a man, Jordan, in the Eid. Celebrating the Eid, we slaughtered in the streets. And what kills me, that municipality of Amman announces in the newspapers, on TV, that places for slaughtering on so-and-so street, on so-and-so corner, which is very criminal, to say the least. I'm not going to dwell on the life cycle. I'll leave that to Dr. Mutasal Bisi. But basically, uh, once Dr. Mutasal tells you the life cycle, and once it gets to the human, it takes time to grow. It grows by one to two centimeters per year. And these are some of the hydatid cells that I removed. Some of them, they can grow faster. This grew in nine months from this size to this size. The main thing to remember is that this cyst is in the brain on the liver. So this is the host area, is host capsule. And then we have the laminated area and the germinal layer. So three layers. Again, we will elaborate on this with Dr. Hassan Mufarsakh. So the global burden of identity disease is very, very heavy. In China, where it is endemic, in this period, 96 to 2010, 58 hospitals. They treated 21,000 more, and 45 patients, they had brain hydrated. Again, the burden lies on the children. In France, a developed country, in the period between 82 and 2007, they treated 387 patients. So whether you are underdeveloped or developed, you will get the disease if you're not careful. Montessor, uh, can you give us? Sure. An idea about the epidemiology. Thank you, dear Dr. Brahim. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, it is unfortunate that we still have to see these cases and uh, the suffering of these patients is very real, as I'll try to show some illustrative cases. Um, the, uh, this is caused by a parasite called Echinococcus granulosus. It's one of four, but the most common worldwide is Echinococcus granulosus. Endemic areas, pretty much wherever sheep are reared for human consumption. South America, Eastern Europe and Turkey and Greece, uh, the Mediterranean Basin, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and um, if I can just elaborate a little bit on the life cycle. Um, so, we'll see if we can do it this way. Um, dogs consuming um, um, raw uh, sheep uh, leftovers from slaughtering get uh, the infective stage. It develops in their gut, grows into an adult, and releases a, an embryonated egg egg consumed by man or child or by sheep. Uh, so this could be a dog that had some poop, excuse my language, uh, on the grass, on strawberry, on lettuce, you know, ground vegetables. And then someone consumes them without washing them uh, properly and in it goes into the gut. It crosses over to the portal circulation and establishes itself in the liver, typically. Or it can be disseminated more to the lungs and other places, including the brain, the bones, um, spleen, kidney, and so on. Um, so dogs get it from eating leftovers of sheep, what uh, dear uh, Dr. Speer had shown us in these abattoirs, in these uh, makeshift slaughterhouses, you know? that we see in every leaf, so absolutely no control. So you throw one of those things, um, and in countries that have tried to control this disease, they look for animals that have the disease, and they either incinerate these, um, for example, the liver and uh, whatever, spleen, or they freeze it to minus 18 to kill the protoscolices, and then they throw them in landfills. If we feed one of those to the dog, the dog, you know, stray dogs are going to transmit this uh, across. And children are the most vulnerable. Uh, Dr. Muntasir, yes, sir. But it seems that the dogs uh, are the ones that transmit it to human beings. Correct. Not the sheep. Correct. That's what I said. So dogs get it from the sheep, and dogs spread it to the sheep and to humans. Um, inadvertently, because you know, dogs are man's best friend, dogs are very close to us. Uh, dogs can poop on the beach, dogs can poop in the prairies, um, can poop on uh, vegetables, ground vegetables, especially. Uh, and then we consume and we get the disease. Clinical manifestations may range from an incidental finding by our dear radiologists. Uh, or to space occupying lesion with mass effects such as on the portal vein or intrahepatic biliary ducts causing um, jaundice. It is found in the liver uh, most commonly alone in 75% of cases and in 25% of cases liver and another locality. Uh, lungs, heart, mediastinal, pleural, pericardial, and then brain, kidney, muscle, bone, and spleen. They may manifest as uh, by rupture or leak causing anaphylactic reaction. They may get secondarily infected with bacteria and come in with fever and abscess-like picture, or they may hemorrhage. And I'll quickly run you through some illustrative cases from my own practice. Uh, case number one was that of a 24-year-old male that came in with vague abdominal pain. You can almost discern some discomfort or a bit of a tenderness in the right uh, upper quadrant. And lo and behold, he had a huge cyst with some uh, um, um, this, uh, daughter cyst or, or movement of the actual uh, capsule over here. You can see the capsule coming off. Went to surgery. During surgery, uh, there was uh, aspiration, injection of ethanol, and re aspiration uh, and re injection until they got all the liquid out and we're able to remove the capsule intact, as you can see. 
Um, 29 year old male mechanic with right upper quadrant pain, and you can see that this uh, a huge uh, hepatic abscess, um, I'm, I'm sorry, cyst uh, has ruptured, giving what is so uh, no, what is known as lily sign, water lily sign, with some hepatic uh, hypertrophy. Of note, you know, cochal titers, and we'll talk about those. Number one, I see in the audience was one over 1280. Case three, uh, a male gentleman from Saudi Arabia that arrived with dyspnea uh, and it's just x-ray, you can almost discern uh, this extra shadow. A CT scan showed that cyst with calcification and echo showed two cysts uh, in the heart with calcification, compressing the left ventricle and he went to surgery. So that's a case of cardiac echinococcus. Um, this 64-year-old Iraqi male university professor uh, was brought in by his apprehensive wife. Why? Because he had stopped uh, breathing and collapsed five days ago on the street. And this was not the first time around. He's had a similar attack seven and ten years ago. Um, and so much so that she now carries a, a, an epi, uh, epinephrine uh, pen with her. He didn't seem to care, but she was worried about a deeper uh, problem. And lo and behold, he has these cysts in his liver, and we think he had probably a leak, a spontaneous leak, that caused an anaphylactic shock. Uh, his titers were high, 2560, and um, the, his IgE levels were uh, elevated, and there is support from the literature for such happenings. Uh, went to surgery and um, has been doing well since then. I won't belabor uh, all of that. Um, now, this is probably the saddest of all cases, uh, being a 26-year-old uh, female who had a road traffic accident in her um, college graduation, school graduation, and was left um, uh, crippled from the waist down. Uh, struggled and uh, got a uh, bachelor's degree from a respectable university and was uh, seeking to get a master's degree. So came in for a physical and her chest x-ray showed these huge um, cystic lesions in the lungs. Uh, she was treated. We opted not to take her to surgery because of the high risk. Um, and uh, I believe it was one Friday morning that her frantic mom called me and said she had collapsed on the floor. They called 911, got her to the hospital, but unfortunately she suffered uh, irreversible brain uh, uh, injury and died. When she came in, the most glaring uh, uh, finding was the absence of one of those cysts. So the cyst had ruptured and caused an anaphylactic shock and she uh, died. A uh, 56 year old male with dysphasia came in with this brain lesion. Um, and with brain lesions, we know about 20 to 30% there's a lesion elsewhere. And so he was scanned and he had a hepatic uh, lesion as well. Uh, as uh, uh, explained by Dr. Spray, uh, brain lesions are rather rare, uh, one to 2% of all cases, more, uh, more in children. Uh, and they characteristic, characteristically are, um, with serology, only 4% would be positive, and this patient was negative. Uh, is the seeding at the same time? Uh, yes. Well, we don't know. I mean, uh, the uh, typical time to presentation is an average of seven months, but maybe anything from six uh, months to three years. They're supposed to grow by one to two centimeters a year. So my question would be, is, is this just, I mean, yes. the actual infection is both locations in the same? Yes, sir. So these were obtained at the same uh, clinical evaluation setting. Management surgery for the longest time was the main uh, tier of management and still is for these following indications. Complicated cyst with rupture or fistula, or if it's compressing a vital organ, we want uh, to get it out. If it has too many doctor vesicles and well, not suitable for pair, if the size is larger than 10 centimeters in diameter, a superficial cyst at risk of rupture, 
uh, and extrahepatic disease in the lungs, bone, and brain. But I just showed you that clinical judgment must be practiced. We had a guy that had a leak. It's not in these indications, but you know that's medicine. You have to use your judgment, obviously. A contraindication would be for an inactive or calcified cyst. Now, uh, pear is uh, a modified. Why yes, sir. Is uh, if it is compressing, uh, I'm not yeah, just compressing a vital structure now that I get this as an indication. And you're putting number five as, as a sweeping rule that exacerbating disease by itself is an indication, regardless of the compression of the vital structure. Uh, no, no. I'm not understanding the lines. These are the in, informal uh, advices and guidelines and textbooks, but as it happens clinically, we don't take that you know too strictly. We only go for surgery if it's compressing a vital organ that uh, is making the patient present with symptoms uh, of obstruction. Or a chance of rupture. Or a chance of rupture, absolutely, yes. Uh, so PEAR has been practiced for a while. It stands for percutaneous aspiration, injection, and re-aspiration of a scolicidal agent. The idea is that we get some of the fluid full of infection, scolices, uh, and inject alcohol or uh, um, hypertonic saline to kill the other scolices in the fluid, such that when surgery is done it, and there's a spill, it doesn't cause dotrosis, or we are trying to sterilize the cyst as such. Okay, by sterilize, killing a potentially uh, all potentially infectious agents. Is that what causes basically your anaphylaxis? Are you also trying to control anaphylaxis? Or is the fluid itself? The fluid? The daughter cells? Or is it the actual um, cells using the actual fluid that's causing the anaphylaxis? Supposedly, every daughter cyst contains anything from 10 to 100 uh, scolices, the protoscolices, the infectious agent. And it's a tremendous storm of antigens that enters the system. Just like and, septic shock. Yes, yeah, sir. Exactly. So, so um, if you kill it off or you do hypertonic saline, you're basically controlling that issue. You're trying to control for that because you get a, uh, um, a storm of um, mast cell degranulation. Uh, and, it, you know, if this, the shock part is very real. So, back to Dr. Marwan's question it's the scolices that, that are the culprit. Right? Yeah, we want to kill they're those. They're the antigenic here. They're the antigenic component, they're the infectious component as well. So if these leak into the intra-abdominal cavity, for example, you get those. Um, there is a WHO working group the, um, classification depending on the uh, integrity, I'm sorry, depending on uh, the actual content of the cyst, uh, defining an active cyst uh, by these appearances and inactive by calcification. Uh, and I'll explain in a bit uh, how we use that for treatment. So depending on which stage the patient has uh, by ultrasound, being the poor man's method of uh, radiology, uh, we can give, dole out the treatment, whether uh, chemotherapy, uh, benzoyl alone, or with pair, or with surgery. I won't be late, bore you with the details, but the medical therapy available to us these days is uh, quite effective. It's albendazole, um, and we uh, give anything from one to six months in adjunctive to surgery or pair. Um, and it causes significant less recurrence um, before or after surgery. So someone might be going to surgery, we'll give them albendazole be pre-op to try and kill those scolices. Uh, or someone went to surgery, they found, oh my God, it's a high cyst, get it out send them to ID, we give them albendazole. Um, Prezequental, despite this uh, uh, supposed lack of efficacy data, there are um, papers that recommend this both as uh, pre-op prophylaxis, uh, there's a paper from Pakistan uh, that showed a lesser incidence of recurrence when we use Prezequental upfront in combination with albendazole. Okay. Yes. So prezequental may be used. It's not the standard of therapy, but we have resorted to it um, in, in certain situations. Albendazole inhibits microtubular assembly and kills the germinal layer cell, showed to us earlier by Dr. Speyer. 
It is poorly absorbed and must be taken with fatty meals. We observed for uh, adverse events such as hepatotoxicity, uh, cytopenias, uh, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, the outcome of albendazole treatment as evaluated by ultrasound, 30% uh, cyst resolves, uh, 30 to 50% there's reduction in size, and in 20 to 40% it stays the same by ultrasound. So, um, what is the penetration for the blood brain barrier with these patients? It's very good. For all of them? Presequental, uh, well, albendazole, and. Presequental, less so. Albendazole is the most uh, available in the central system. Presequental is what we used for uh, what we use for schistosoma, for the hair cell. Do you get the same kind of results? Uh, Albendazole has better uh, outcomes and is more reliable and is the standard, the gold standard of therapy. Presequental may be used if you can't find albendazole or if you want to use it in combination with albendazole. But the gold standard of, of medical therapy is albendazole. It used to be mavendazole, now albendazole is the uh, standard. <clears throat> so parasite control, basically look at these, although they make sense that, you know, for some reason, they're not practiced in our country and in many other countries, including, you know, not to name names, <laughs> Turkey, Greece, uh, the Mediterranean Basin. Uh, before I came to see you guys, I was reading a paper from Algeria. So this is a common problem. And it is, uh, seemed, uh, seems to be a problem of uh, Muslim communities, but also Christian communities. But I know for us, you know. It's a cultural thing, not the religious. Yes, it's a cultural thing. Uh, in the heydays of the old uh, wild west, of course, you slaughter your own khawf and you're very happy about it, but that doesn't cut it anymore. It does not cut it anymore. It's a very dangerous practice uh, to have the seeds shown to us by Dr. Speh. And it almost seems like there's an increased incidence lately of these. We're seeing more cases. Um, and it does not surprise me one little bit. Uh, where I live in Marjan Hammam, you know, stray dogs are abound, and we call the, the, the authorities, and they come and they don't come, and plenty of stray dogs. So the chance of having this disease and perpetuating its transmission is very real, and um, I think it's, it's continuing in our country. Countries that have been able to uh, eradicate this, such as New Zealand, have done a tremendous, tremendous work. The veterinarians screen the sheep and any sheep that's found to be infected uh, is, is slaughtered and then they decontaminate with either incinerating the whole sheep or uh, uh, using um, freezing to minus 18 degrees to kill the protoscolis and then they throw them in landfills. Uh, and they're very, very strict about this. Uh, something that I cannot imagine happen in our country. Just to preach the animal life part of me, a human health problem is not done. The real problem is humans, not the species. I think you can generalize that to pretty much everything. Humans yes, are the problem. Yes, <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> the poor animals have to pay the price of our indiscretions. Uh, infection control concerns, there's no person to person transmission as you do the surgery. Uh, of course, you have to properly dispose of the resected material and for sure don't feed it to the dog. So I guess that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Welcome. I have a quick question. Yes, yes sir. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, a couple of, uh, first, what's the, how often the albendazole uh, sterilize that cyst? Essentially, I put a needle in there, I spray the, the all the polyols in there are dead. That's the first question. Um, it, dep it depends on the duration of use. So we like to get at least three cycles in before you guys uh, do something like that if possible. And by three cycles, it's four weeks on and two weeks off of the medicine. Uh, if we complete that, it's 90%, it's not 100%. That, that, I think that's very important, I think the duration, because uh, we, we experience, we, as you know, we, we, we do the fair technique, yes. a fair cutaneous technique. And on a couple of occasions in the liver, after uh, two cycles, the patient got kind of mild anaphylaxis by just puncturing the cyst and aspirating before injection. So uh, I, I totally feel 
if you are 100% accurate. Two cycles were not enough to actually sterilize that system. Yes. So uh, that's from uh, just a few cases that we did. Absolutely. And even if we sterilize it, the chance of an anaphylactic shock yeah, is still there yeah. because the antigen load is still there. So my question exactly now is the scolices dead or alive are equally uh, antigenic? Yes, they so are. When they're dead, they're less yes. or more? So it's so antigen. equally antigenic. So you wouldn't really expect the anaphylaxis rate to change at all by giving uh, a pre-operative uh, 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 Perhaps if it ruptures, it does not make any difference. Right. Good. Right. The worst thing that could happen is for this to rupture during surgery. Oh, and that's what makes Yanni, uh, what you do so, uh, so uh, admirable to get any kind of cyst out uh, and what Taman Farid does. And so mainly the, the aim of therapy is to prevent future daughter cysts if there's a spill. Um, but the anaphylaxis well, decreases a bit, but still very high. That's very important is the fact that probably if you sterilize the cyst, cyst rupture either when you do it intravenously or surgically that since those actually pathogens that are spreading through the atonium or whatever they will not contaminate the rest of the area so you yes. not have correct a thousand highly yes. resistant the acid <coughs> that's the major uh, um, point of therapy yes not the risk of an infection which yes. is the same yeah. yes okay my colleague professor to tell us about the histology of things uh, there's a question there before the class on. So, Janine? Uh, I just want to say that with respect to dogs, we stray dogs. Uh, I was in Machu Picchu in uh, Peru, and the inhabitants were on 30,000, and the stray dogs were 60,000. Oh and there was no mention about identities there. Yes. And I also want to make a comment about the use of albendazole. I thought the albendazole was more. Uh, uh, useful or give you better results if the, uh, uh, the lungs are involved rather than the liver because of the uh, uh, very, very small uh, membrane there in the lungs rather than uh, in the liver. Uh, I would also give you one uh, bad or good experience of mine back in the early 1980s when there was no CT scan or ultrasound and I had a Saudi had a very, very big mass in the liver, and over time we had only radioisotopes. And so I elected to do the radioisotope and then biopsy. But then what happened is that radioisotopes uh, did not come up with the, uh, uh, the results. So I was in the operating theater trying to do a liver biopsy with a Mangini needle at that time, which is 16 gauge. <coughs> and the minute I went in, I could feel the pop. Yes. And then I froze. Right. You know what and was then, going next. And then I pushed the <laughs> needle very fast. And the patient was still breathing. Oh, he, kept, he was breathing and breathing. And did well after that. And I told him, no, you go to Saudi Arabia <laughs> and operate for your high death assist. Yes. Three years later, he came to me and said, yes, I went. I had an operation and everything. Everything was fine. But I felt the pop right. when you go right. in. Well, it was an eight, 16 gauge needle, and that was a big biopsy needle. And you gave him an acnepsum with the pump? I'm sorry? You gave him an acnepsum with the pump? Well, you didn't give him anything. You didn't give him anything. I didn't give him anything. I just froze first, you know, <laughs> and then I pulled out my needle and that's it. You are filled with epinephrine. <laughs> yes! Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet this all works equally well, just uh, equally well in the lungs and liver. Thank so, you. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and just to make the discussion on the other side, I mean, I was a medical student, also many people, many of our mentors, they make us uh, afraid of really uh, anaphylactic, anaphylactic shock of uh, hydatid cyst. But in my experience, I think it is much overrated than it's actual. I personally uh, did more than 20 cases of aspiration, binding aspiration of hydatid cyst and nothing happened with them. And Dr. Junaid, you mentioned this case, uh, and I think we, we presented one case at the GI conference where I uh, aspirated the high dietary cyst and the, the patient given abinagazole and he improved dramatically and nothing happened with him. And this is not only my experience, and then I went into literature and I found some people who did find needle on high cyst 
and they said that it's really overrated the chance of uh, anaphylactic, anaphylactic shock. So I don't want you to go with the idea that hydatidosis is so common to get, it's actually very rare. I have done 20 cases, some of them published in the YouTube and the patient did nothing happen to them. So it's not really something that you should really very much alert with them or be afraid or be dangerous because uh, our actual experience and experience of others, yes, you can do it and there's nothing danger. Although there are some cases, but it didn't, I reviewed the literature actually, a very, very, very rarely have been with a fine needle aspiration. You should be prepared with everything. Yeah, but it, sometimes the, the, the patient was referred to us not, not because they, they are suspected it had that assist, we found it in the uh, histology. So it is, it is not really actually so dangerous. I don't want you to go with the idea that it's so dangerous to uh, do, do fine needle aspiration. No, it is not dangerous. Not my experience alone, but other experience, and I have reviewed extensive the literature on this idea is not really so dangerous. One is only one case away. You're only one case away of changing your mind. So <laughs> no, it's not me. It's not me only. I reviewed the literature on that. Okay, one case. But I need an inspiration, and, and I'm really I have reviewed extensive the literature because we have discussed this in the GI meeting. The Romi, you remember Dr. Virginia presented one case about it, and we we. We have this, this discussion, and I reviewed the literature extensively. You go and review literature, and you see that people um, do not agree on this all, all the way. Anyhow, uh, in this case, let's go. This is the high that is cyst that we received lately, uh, and you can see it's really very good round shape uh, high that is cyst, uh, and uh, it's actually floating on the. Uh, this is a formalin, so it's cystic and formalin. And see how it's glistening. Uh, the surface is very smooth. This is taken, uh, Dr. Brahim Spech took it from a brain of uh, one patient. And you can see the size of it. And uh, it's almost transparent. Uh, I want to show you uh, this video. Uh, when I rupture it, I really took picture of its rupture. What's up? <coughs> you remove it completely, without completely. And it's very interesting to see really something that probably would, you don't see much. I'm not sure, let's see how, how the fluid is coming. And this is clear fluid coming out of it. And it is slightly like a sticky fluid. And you feel it in sticky fluid. Uh, but it is clear. And this is what you get when it's not infected. And this is different from the uh, one that we usually in the liver. See the wall, how it is thin? Usually the liver ones, region, when I received them, most of the time they have really thick wall, not the brain tissue, which usually does not form fibrosis. This is typical histology. Uh, this is, uh, these are the uh, uh, scoliosis, and these are the hooks. Uh, these are the parasites. Because you can see the hooks in them, uh, probably in some higher power. These are all different scoliosis size, and these are the hooks, you can see them. And this sometimes be very helpful. This sometimes not all what you see in fine needle aspiration material, the hooks, they are very, very typical. And uh, all the cases that I have done, 20 cases, most of these cases I diagnose them by the hooks. You see them by, by fine needle respiration cytology, and they are very, very good uh, clue that this is, and it is diagnostic, pathognomonic, when it's there. Uh, you can see more of the scoliosis. I talk more. See, these are the hooks that usually spread inside the fluid. Uh, a lot of the things that you see in the fluid are from the hooks. The scoliosis are not common. Again, you can see the hooks there in these spaces. Uh, they attach them to the wall. You can see different areas. Again, you can see these are the hooks, and this is the scoliosis. The hooks are present on the periphery on the scoliosis. Uh, this, the third one, we, we, are, we have, we can diagnose econococcus by histology by either scoliosis or hooks, which are the most common, or laminated bodies. And this is the laminated bodies. Bishpahokir zuhal, halakat zuhal. You can see them how they are laminated bodies. Uh, this is the outer layer, actually, biomaterial bio attached to them. This is biomaterial attached to them. But you can see these are 
مثل مثل حلقات زحم تيبيكال اند وين يو جو هاير باور او شو يو ذيس از زي ما حكينا حلقات زحل ساترن رينجز اند ذيس ار ذا بايو ماتيريال اتاش تو ذا بريفري يو كان سي ذيس از وات يو جو لايك وين يو جو انتو حلقات زحل يو كان سي ذيس ار ديرتي ماتيريال بس كل وحده ماشيين بحلقات يو جيف يو امبرشن ذيس وات وي كول لامينيتد بوديز يو كان سي ذيم فيري بيوتيفول And when you see this, it's not pathognomonic, but it is diagnostic uh, of a uh, hydatid cyst. Uh, so these are the three really histology things. This is the biomaterial that usually when, the, not, as, as I said, in the brain usually is not, uh, uh, you don't see gliosis, but you, the biomaterial at, attached itself to the outer surface of this material, uh, of the cyst, as you could see here, these are from uh, meningeal cells. Uh, these are from the uh, um, eliminated bodies. And this biomaterial is cytokeratin 5-6 positive and epithelial membrane antigen positive. These are eliminated bodies. And uh, low molecular weight cytokeratin positive. So this is our, these are the features of hydratid system. <coughs> so which are the organs in our bodies that are affected by hydratid? Any anatomical sign from head to toe. Liver is the commonest, 75. Lung follows, 15%. Central nervous system, brain, and spinal cord. Bones, long bones, and others, including kidney, breast, thyroid, spleen, breast, heart, and others. Orbit, and that is just in the orbit. And the orbit from Iran. Parotid gland. These are papers published. I had access to the internal acoustic canal, internal auditory meatus, Peter's bone. Involving the skull. You may think this is uh, hemangioma, you may think of other skull lesions. Can be extradural, like this extradural cyst. Here it can be in the infratemporal fossa, extradural, epidural, again extradural from Turkey, and it can affect the brain. Now, in the brain, it's rare, it's 0.5% of all masses, but in endemic countries, it's higher, 3%. The thing that breaks your heart is that 50 70% are seen in children. This is extradural pseudofossa. Again, extradural pseudofossa. You can actually misdiagnose these lesions easily. Subdural, extradural and subdural. This is subdural cyst. This is inside the brain in children. From Tunisia and North Africa is also an endemic area. It's in the brain. Again, in the brain, primary identity from India, from Turkey. And look at this unusual size in the interhemispheric area or inside the ventricle. And these are the most dangerous because if they rupture, death is a must. From Lebanon. Can they rupture spontaneously in this location? Yes. Can rupture during sport, spontaneously, surgical intervention, trauma, whatever. This is a very interesting paper from Lebanon, and it was published in 2005 in the epic of the Lebanese war by Dr. Fuad Haddad and his son, George Haddad. Uh, Fuad Haddad is a very senior neurosurgeon. In fact, he's one of the three neurosurgeons that were in the Middle East in the 50s and the 60s. Fuad Haddad, one of them, Anton Tarazi. Uh, here in Palestine and Jordan, yes, and uh, uh, Rashid Juma from Pakistan. So to have a paper from Lebanon in this in this period is to be respected. Another one from Syria, and this is a new. I think it's twenty. Yes, recent again in the epic of the Syrian war. Still, they are publishing. We in Jordan we don't like publication. Yes, it's not important. 
from India, 2007, look at this site. It's in the brainstem. Now that is a different kettle of fish. How to diagnose, how to approach, and what to do. You cannot use the usual surgical methods here. You go for aspiration and put in some clorhexidine and then try to take the capsule out. This is the... Actually, <laughs> there is a paper about this and I'm gonna show you that. Again, brainstem, I got it. Again, this is from Syria this year, January this year. Again, amazing that they are publishing. From Saudi Arabia, this pre pontine thing. It did not end the, in a good way, but they tried their best there. Again, another brainstem. Yes. With these uh, ones that you showed us, all these people who had the cyst in other locations as well, or were they purely in other? Most of them, they had it and somewhere else, but some of the few of them, they had it just only in the brain, which is amazing. How few? Five, ten percent? In my series, I had one case, a brain without anything. In the literature, 10 to 30 percent. Yes. Thank you. 10 to 30. Now, coming to the spine, again, it's rare, but again, the spine here is difficult to treat. Difficult to treat in the sense that it is considered as a palliative treatment. It is high recurrence rate and high mortality and morbidity. Look at these lesions. They could be extradural, they could be intradural extramedullary, they could be intramedullary. Again, you can see these are actual cases. Odontoid process. Thoracic spine. Again, here thoracic spine. Treated with, of course, to put a, a foreign material like fixation in and something like this is something controversial. Again, I did it just in the thoracic spine and the sacrum. So from yeah, that is structured, absolutely. That's why you need fixation. Sacrum completely destroyed from Tunisia. And here in this case, because the straw was so destructive and they could not excise it, they actually put a drain and kept that for drainage and injection of uh, materials there. Now, if such cases are treated medically, can you avoid fixation when there is such no, on the spine? No, no. Uh, you have to think of hydatid in the brain and spine completely different than in other parts of the body. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, it's totally different story. So we do not like in the brain at all aspiration. It's forbidden. No, I was talking about medical treatment. Yes, not aspiration. sure. Heart, it likes the left ventricle, but it could be anywhere. Again, you can see there, in brain and heart from Croatia. Again, the ventricle, this is the heart being opened. And the lungs, pulmonary. <clears throat> Remember, 15% of them affect the lung. Liver is 75%. Look at this here. Kidneys. And renal hydatus is presenting with hydaturia. And the urine passing some of these colicins. And... Uh, Cysts. Urinary bladder. Momentum. Lung bones. From Iran again, lung bones. Soft tissue muscles. Soft tissue in the neck. Soft tissue again in the versus medialis. What about radiology of these, of these lesions? There's typical radiology and the atypical radiology. The worst one is the atypical ones. And people would say, why should I know? You must know, because if you want to deal with these cases, you have to keep your mind open. Rounded, well defined. Not all of them are, are rounded and well defined. Unilocular, they can be multilocular. Contents of low density like that of the CSF, sometimes they are not. T1 hyper intensity, T2 hyper intense. Sometimes they are not. This is typical radiology, rounded, well defined. It looks like CSF, etc. 
This is typical radiology. Sometimes you can see actually the capsule. You can see the sand. The scolus is precipitating in the bottom. They don't usually take contrast. There are cases reported with contrast. And what would you diagnose here? You diagnose abscess, you diagnose a glioma, you diagnose TV, whatever. Calcification is very rare, but it can happen. Reported, calcified cysts, calcified cysts, look at this. So you have to worry about the uncommon cases, primary calcified. Would you ever think of this as hydatid cyst? Not the shape, not the color, not anything. Tunisia again, unusual brain edema. Usually they are not associated with brain edema. Here are some cases which were associated with brain edema. It could be single cyst or could be having daughter cyst inside. So daughter cyst. Single cyst with some daughter cysts. Or multilocular like this. Multilocular, you can see the regulations. Multi, multiple cysts, not one, but multiple. Again, you have multiple intracranial hydatid cysts in a boy. Multiple cysts. Disseminated, meaning that it is in multiple organs. Again, look at this. If anyone can think of this as hydatid, he should be given the status of uh, United States uh, President. Multilocularis. Infected, they can get infected. So, again, here infected. Presenting as cerebral metastasis, mass, just like any brain tumor. Alveolar, again, presenting very unusual like a tumor. So what's the differential diagnosis? Should we be afraid? Yes. My message to you, be afraid. Think of the kind of caucus cysts, because you will face trouble if you don't. Arachnoid cysts. <coughs> Poor encephalic cyst after trauma or surgical treatment. Megal encephalic leukodystrophy, subcortical cysts. Epidermoid cysts, dermoid cysts, choroid fissure cysts, ependymal cyst, side the ventricle, choroid fissure cyst, as we mentioned, choroid plexus cyst, parenchymal cyst from the parenchyma. Neuroglial cysts, neuroepithelial neuroglial cysts again, enterogenous cysts, one of my patients, a recce patient with this, uh, enlarged perivascular spaces, which is very unusual, but it can, you can face it. Abscess, bacterial, non bacterial, neurocystic especially if multiple. Tumor, a mangioblastoma cyst. Sometimes you don't see the nidule. So you go and try to take it out and it ruptures and the patient will die on the table or die later on out of metastasis of these cysts. Pilocytic astrocytoma, oh, a cyst with a small nidule. Yes, well, this could be part of the capsule of hydatid cysts. Metastasis, so be careful. So once a cystic piece, once a cystic lesion is found, hydatid must be considered in countries where it is endemic. Before I give you the microphone, last my colleagues, the uh, radiologists, about how they feel. Please. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, it depends the imaging findings on the type of the echolococcus. The granulosis types, usually typically single, large cyst. 
it comes in children and there is no calcification, no edema, no inhalants unless it is complicated. The difficult one is the alveolar star. This is the one which is the nightmare for the large differential with Dr. Rahim Sida. It came more in adults, it has calcification more, it has soft tissue enhancement, nodular or peripheral, and it can be confused to as a tube. It can be multiple small cystic lesion or solid lesion throughout the whole brain. And it is very difficult. Usually, but I want to remember you that the high data is the second most common parasite for the brain after the cystocercosis. So it is not in our area, you have, you have to think it when, when you see it, okay? The treatment, Dr. Rahim, he covered it, but I want you to remember always that if it becomes enhancing, or there is edema, sometimes maybe it is complicated, okay? So diffusion restriction, you can't see diffusion restrictions on the MRI. And if you see enhancement, it is multiple, you have to think of alveolar stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Bani. But uh, the hypothesis uh, from a radiology point of view, the other time is. There are two types. One is the uh, typical. We have the cyst, as we saw, without any calcification, or even if there is a calcification, it's about 1%. There's no edema, there is no wall enhancement. Uh, atypical uh, one is sometimes it has a wall enhancement and it has edema. I think it's not edema, it's leaky. This is some uh, leak of the cyst and uh, it indicates an ongoing inflammation rather than uh, <clears throat> uh, other thing is. A differential diagnosis of typical, there are three main things. One is hydatid cyst intra-parenchymal. The second one is neuroepithelial cyst. The first, the, the most important thing is to go to the flare. If there is any gliosis, you have to go to other category. If there is no meiosis, they are three differential diagnosis, not more. Now, <clears throat> if there is an enhancement, there is a lot of differential diagnosis. The most important thing is abscess. But if you have to go to diffusion, the abscess has restrictive diffusion, but the hydaxis does not. Uh, second one, metastasis. If you look for metastasis, <clears throat> first of all, metastasis has the regular wall, has the dual in the wall. Uh, if you go to spectroscopy, it has very high lactate. But if you go to spectroscopy for hydatases, if you have uh, amino acid, you have alanine, you have a uh, lactate, you have uh, acetate. <clears throat> also, you have the most important thing is pyruvate, which is can be found in 2.4 ppm. The third thing is, as Dr. Ibrahim said, is a high-grade tumor. But almost the high-grade tumor has a soft tissue nodule. You should have a soft tissue nodule. And if you go to the spectroscopy, also all this tumor has choline and have low and AA. But a high cyst does not have choline at all. Can you get the point that are taking this further? I mean, how much can you help the neurologist or the neurosurgeon in making a diagnosis of the hypertensive cyst? <coughs> and how much with the modern technology now? With yes. scans and uh, functional imaging and so on and so on. How close can you come to a definitive diagnosis or at least to cut to, to know, to know your differential diagnosis? It's, it's crucial for any yes. surgeon who wants to attack something like this. Uh, <coughs> uh, I said before, if the uh, uh, cyst is a typical one, it's typical one, you have to go to, go to a spectroscopy. Now, spectroscopy, as I said before, there is an alanine, there is an lactate, acetate, what? Acetyl <laughs> and uh, amino acid. 
and has the most important thing is bioviate. Uh, I think Dolores Mendoza knows that is bioviate is very important, is found only in high data sets in 2.4 ppm in uh, spectroscopy. If you go to high data sets, we have just only lactate. If you go to the neuroepithelial cyst, it has choline because it's an, a neural cyst. But the others has no choline. I can know my differential diagnosis in addition to uh, conventional T1, T2, uh, uh, flare sequence, because there is no gliosis, and uh, also diffusion can help. If it's a typical, if it's an atypical now, this is uh, my problem, but I have to go to spectroscopy also. I can differentiate between uh, high dash cells and uh, high glioma by choline and acetate. It has acetate and choline, but high dash cells does not have, have also more amino acids. Uh, metastasis, metastasis has very high lactate only. So only lactate. My conclusion is that you can be to a higher degree to say this is a hydrolysis rather than something else. Yes. You can say the most likely diagnosis is a hydrolysis. If I go to spectroscopy the and sometimes perfusion yes. can have a lot. What about, what about low grade glioma as opposed to high grade glioma? And this is a psychoma, for example. Yes. A perfect example of a low grade glioma that's much less greater than this. Does not enhance, but it has codeine. It has codeine and, and AA. But uh, hydrolysis does not have. Right. Okay. What I wanted to say is this before the, I give the microphone is that radiologists can help if they want to, if they really go deep into discussions. But most of the reports are flimsy three lines, always the same no aneurysms, no AVMs, no shift of ventricular system, the income is okay. That's the reports we receive because they report in the MRI as well as the chest X ray and the femur X ray. They are not neuroradiologists. And um, I'm I'm going to skip the anatomical cysts and just uh, fixate on on one important slide about from the importance of not missing an abscess. Um, and we discussed the parasitic astrosome and differential. But again, from from spectroscopy to very low tech. For the love of God, nobody should be put on the table without being examined. Properly, meds can easily be uh, uh, ruled out or ruled in by a good thorough physical examination. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but we have a whole generation of new so-called medical students who have no idea how to examine patients. Thorough or otherwise, they simply are built into the culture that, oh, no, uh, you just check for radiology reports and nobody bothers to examine patients. A lot of meds, not all of them though, a lot of meds would you can detect a primary on a thorough physical examination. Putting a, a female patient on the neurosurgical table because nobody, uh, nobody bothered to detect the three by three centimeter breast mass is criminal to say the least. And these meds do happen. And we see them every day, not every week. And we preach again against this every day, not every week. Not to mention the um, uh, uh, abscess issue that can easily be missed because nobody bothered to look into the teeth, nobody bothered to look at the oral, uh, oral hygiene, etc. Okay. Uh, Farid Adam, do you have anything to add from the radiology point of view? Yeah. Okay. So again, this is the golden statement. Once you have a cystic lesion, and if you are an endemic area, like I would think of hydrogen disease, what are the manifestations of these? Of course, it's basically combined lesion, so increased intracranial pressure, headache, motor weakness, vomiting, mental change, visual change, epilepsy, coma, or changes in speech. And for this, I'd like to ask Dr. Maurice Zahdala, senior neurologist, a graduate of the uh, University of London, ex-chairman of the Jordan Neuroscience Society to speak about speech changes. That's, uh, that's, that's there. I know. I'm not, I'm not prepared for this. I can give you just a few um, 
just make a short comment, okay? Oh, you put some slides. Oh, that's very good, yes. Okay, that's great. Now, um, I think many of you who've been at medical school uh, have been taught, we, we've been teaching uh, about speech for the last uh, century using the famous Wernicke Lichtenthal um, model of speech, which is the basic speech of expressive dysphasia, receptive dysphasia, and conductive dysphasia. And we always thought that it was as simple as that. It was simple. And the way that people found out about where these areas lie is from the anatomy and the lesions that people in the past looked at when they opened, when they did postmortems uh, on the brain, and they found out which area is looking after expressive speech and receptive speech speech, etc. Uh, and then they have been um, divided uh, into Broca's area, which is the area in the frontal lobe, which is responsible for expressive speech, Wernicke's area, uh, which is receptive speech, and then there is um, no normal uh, aphasia, and also there's the conductive speech, which is basically when you, um, when somebody speaks, you hear this sound, this goes to the auditory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe, <coughs> and near there is the Wernicke's area. Uh, sorry, there, there is Wernicke's area, which decodes the sound and interprets it, and then either you store it, or if you want to speak, you send it down the line through the conduction between that area uh, to Broca's area. From Broca's area, the speech center if you remember your anatomy it's upside down and uh, what you do is you uh, can is there a uh, where's the where is it here sorry oh this one okay so basically from the speech area is very near to the um, motor area which is looking after your um, mouth and the speech area, the tongue and, and the voice and so on. So it's a very well um, designed brain where you can easily, from the break, if you want to speak, you can send the message to the area which is very near and then you can speak. But in the last, how do we go forward from here? Um, so it all looks very simple. I think it's very important that in the last 30 years, in the last 30 years, with the advent of MRI, functional imaging, uh, magnetoencephalography, and PET scanning, and also the improvement in our understanding by using uh, psychological tests, we have been able to identify that speech really is not that simple. It's really is very complicated, and it doesn't just involve these areas, it involves both sides of the brain, and it involves many other structures in the brain, for example, like the parietal area, the occipital area, and also deep structures like the thalamus. So basically, the, the process of speech is a complicated one, and it's not as simple as we all studied it at medical school. So it's very complicated. And that is very important, why? Because when the surgeon comes in, he has to know the anatomy pretty well, and to know how to approach any lesion which lies in that area. And obviously, any wrong move, any wrong uh, incision can actually cause quite severe damage and permanent damage to the area responsible for speech. So basically, it is very important. So if you have a lesion in that area, um, you have to be lucky to get it in a, an area which is not an eloquent area of the brain, which is responsible for a vital uh, function. And also, you need a very good surgeon who knows his anatomy very well, and when he goes in, he actually pretty much find, uh, knows exactly which area to avoid and how to go for that lesion. And that is the important bit. So in the last 30 years, and we're getting better and better at understanding the areas in the brain, the function of the brain responsible for speech, but it's really more complicated, this is my message I want to put forward, than it really uh, we understood when we were at medical school. Um, no, thank you. Thank you. So basically, Broca's area is in the frontal operculum here, near the motor area of the face and arm. The still part of the severe temporal gyrus is where Wernicke area is where the 
pituitary area, and then the angle of gyrus is the nominal dysphagia, where patients cannot tell you the name of objects. So you show them a pen, what is this? You would say, uh, this is what they write with. What's the name of this? Uh, this is the right with, and so on and so forth. The glasses, uh, this is what they use to see with, and so on. So Broca's is the motor dysphagia, Wernicke is the receptor dysphagia, and angular gyrus is the nominal dysphagia. Now, what are, why are we putting this? Because it has something to do with the video that I'm gonna show you. So what's the treatment? As I said, the first and foremost for the brain is surgery. You don't want to waste time giving medications with anything in the brain, small or large. And your aim is to remove it without rupture. If it ruptures, it's ruptured to the subarachnoid space, it will go to the CSF, either the patient will die on table from anaphylactic shock, or later on within three months due to multiple uh, hydatid cysts everywhere. If you can't, then like in the banister, then you aspirate and remove. That's the, what's called pair technique. Puncture, aspirate, irrigate, resect. We don't use this in the brain unless we cannot. So this is just a palliative thing. If you have multiple cysts, then you target the largest one. Or you do it in stage surgery. Or sometimes you will continue the drainage of cysts like we have seen in the spinal uh, model. Surgery of hydatid cysts of the brain is extremely difficult. Why? Usually you have large size. The wall is very, very thin. They are adherent to the ureter. You have to pass it through the normal brain. There are adhesions around the cyst. If it is close to the ventricle, it's horrifying. And as you doing the surgery, it may rupture and the patient may die or develop meningitis or neurological deficits. This paper from Turkey, 2000, 330 patients, the cranial, 207 excised without rupture, 86 ruptured. This is a very good center, very famous center. Mortality, 10%. So this is a serious disease. So, what to do? How to position your patient on the table beforehand? Once the anesthesia is done, then you have as a surgeon to look over how the patient is put so that you can use the gravity effect during surgery. So if the, if the tumor is here or the cyst is here, you try to put the patient this way so that it would fall down. And then if you want to change position more, then you have to have loose grabbing so that you will not stretch the drapery. You have to have large bone flap and large dura flap. How large? It has to be two to three fourths of the diameter of the cyst. So the bone flap should be large, the dura flap large, so that when the cyst comes out, it is not deformed by the edge of the bone or the dura. So, yes, yes, because if it is deformed, it will rupture. And you have to have careful landing, avoiding cutary lowering the head of the patient, rotating the table, gravity effect, and then the hydrostatic pressure effect. How do we do surgery? By something called Dolling technique. And who is Dolling? Ernesto Dolling from Argentina, 1929. He described this. Injecting saline between the cyst and the brain. And then this is the Dolling technique. As I said, large flat and all these things that we mentioned. And then there was an adjustment on the technique called modified learning technique, and that occurred in 1975. But people from Latin America, from Uruguay, and in this way, I remember the stray dogs 60,000 and the population of 70,000 in Peru, right, Dr. Janine? Uh, 54, again, this is modification. So sometimes they inject saline into the opposite ventricle to push it out. But look at the opening of the bone is larger than the diameter of the cyst. Recurrence is high and it is very dangerous. It can recur in 30%. If you don't, without, uh, rupture? Without, with the rupture. Oh, yes. Yes. 
uh, the time of the occurrence is maximally within one year. This is, again, we put it in the previous ones, but these are some of the cases of multilocularis uh, group. You can be in the pioneer region here. My personal experience with these, I have six cranial hydatid cysts and two spinal hydatid cysts. I could recover one of them. The other one, I could not find the x-rays and so on. This, one patient of mine, is considered to be one of the largest hydatid cysts in the world. So in the brain, it's rare and it is a serious problem. Let's see some of the cases. Seven-year-old patient from Iraq. Look at this huge cyst. So you didn't have any symptoms or anything like this thing? That's the medicine and the aeroport. Unless the patient dies, he is okay. That was. I will show you. I will show you. So these are still pictures, still pictures. As you can see, if I go back, it's close to the surface. This is a good thing and not a good thing because sometimes it's ad adherent to the dura. Is that a child? A child, seven-year-old from Iraq. who used to play with the sheep and dogs and so on. And some of you mentioned that it is transmitted from dogs to human, can be transmitted directly from sheep to human. Especially if you eat a lot, huh? you go and you catch the sheep and see if it's good or not when you do this. So you catch it, put it in your mouth, and leave. So this is how we are separating the dura of the cyst, and then injecting to get it out. Let's see the movie. Yes. The southern part of Libya, they had hydatid cysts when they didn't have any dogs and all that. True. And there's some wind. Uh, you see, there. some camels can also. Camels, foxes, yeah. and all <laughs> So, this is the separation of the dura from the cyst, which is on the surface, which is good. But again, here, yeah, there's some adhesions. And this is the time when it ruptures. So, very, very thin the brain here. You can see the capsule of the cyst. So thin that you can see the inside of it. So transparent. How old is this patient? Seven. Yeah. So we are separating the dura. Again, here your heart stops several times. Because every time you do something, you think it's going to rupture. How long did you take it? How long was the surgery? About uh, four hours. So here you are. Presenting. This is a very atrophic brain on top of it. You separate it. And your aim is to find the good plane of cleavage between the so-called the capsule of the brain, the gliosis, and the true capsule of the uh, high data cyst. And once you do that, you inject saline. <coughs> the saline could be hypertonic saline, 3%, or normal saline. But again, look how transparent it is. Inside are daughter cysts. This one contained by that by volume contained 200 million parasites. 200 million. Imagine if it ruptures, what it's going to cause. So I'm finding the good plane of cleavage, injecting saline, putting the patient with the gravity, adjusting the table. What are you injecting here? Saline. This is just to. It's hydrostatic infection. pressure so that it will separate the adhesions between the cyst yes, and the brain. Yes, yes. And this is held by gravity and by positioning of the patient. No. So that's it. Okay. That's the cavity uh, of the cyst. And that's the boy. Afterwards, and that's the cyst. 12 centimeters by 11 centimeters by 9 centimeters. 
and I took an orange in the theater. Uh, just this is my hand. This is the size of my hand. This is the orange, and look at the cyst. Woman. Yes, it is woman. Second patient with this. No, this is the same patient. Sorry, this is a pre-op and post-op. Pre-op and post-op. Pre and post. Second patient, 56-year-old male patient with this uh, lesion. Now the problem with this lesion is that it is in the dominant hemisphere. He's right-handed. It is in the area of Broca's <coughs> area. Vernicke's area and angular gyrus nominal uh, dysphagia area. You can see the Serbian fissure. This is a good example here. This is the beginning of the Serbian fissure. So Broca's is just here. Here. Did he have any speech problem? Yes, he had. He had actually uh, receptive, expressive, and nominal. Is that That's, how he That's how he presented. So you can see that the stereotemporal is also. So Wernicke is here, Bacchus is here, Nominal is here. Now that's a dilemma for me. Because ideally, the cortical incision should be in the middle so that it will not be deformed. But if I do it in the middle, then I will affect all these structures. So then do we do functional MRI? No. You can see the middle cerebral artery is elevated. Most of the radiologists report this as normal. They don't think of displacement of vessels as abnormality. They are looking for two things, as if the whole vascular pathology is limited to aneurysms and AVMs. So when I see no aneurysm, no AVM, I really feel sick in my heart, because this is not the way it should be. No, very few radiologists will report that the middle cerebral is really elevated. Look at it. Chest X-ray was normal. There's a cyst in the liver, confirming that this is. Are you, are you saying that the radiologist reported this? Did you mention that? Yes. Ninety-nine of cases did not. And you knew this was a, there was a massive. Yes. Okay. I use navigation. She hadn't had the navigation. Hamza from Masjid Azad Saleh was with us. Again, here I'm trying to find exactly because this is a serious business. I don't want to just save this patient's life and then giving him permanent dysphagia or permanent neurological deficits. So I'd like to know exactly what I am. So we use navigation. Again, I put this picture. This is Broca's, this is Wernicke. This is Sylvian Fisher. And again, if I do this incision here, I will catch Broca's and Wernicke. If I go in the posterior, in the severe temporal gyrus, I'll get Wernicke. So I had really to, I did not sleep that night, thinking of how would I approach this? So if I do this here, it's dangerous. If I do it here, it's dangerous. Ideally, I should put it here because it's in the middle so that the cyst would come out without any deformation. If I put the incision here, I'm away of the important structures, but then the cyst has to go sort of sideways to go out. As if you want to get me out of this door, you get me out of that door, so I'm deformed. So this is the finding, doing the cortical incision and injecting and getting it out. Let's see the surgery. What did you call your incision? I will not see it again. So this is, this is top here, this is Below, bottom, anterior, posterior. This is the temporal lobe. This is the Sylvian fissure. If I do the incision here, I'll catch a broccus and angular gyrus. If I do it here, I will catch a Wernicke. So I, I opted to go this way and then squeeze my way this way. That's the cyst right there, right? Yes. You have to do cortical incision by about one or two, 1.5 centimeters. So you have to know, yeah, now we are injecting this align. At the same time I'm injecting this align, I have 3%, 25% or 50% saline uh, packs so that if it ruptures, I'll put it immediately. Again, see how transparent it is. This is normal saline, the one that you did. This is normal saline, yes. I only use the hypertonic if it ruptures. This would help take the adhesions away. With the effect of the gravity, then 
starts coming out. Again, how, to, how you position your patient from the beginning, how to adjust the table is so important. Wow. wow, that's cool. And this is the site of the incision. You can see Brockes is here, Wernicke is here. This is the cavity. Okay. So lots of uh, mental process should go into that. This is immediate post op the following day, showing complete accession of the cyst with no complications. And this is the patient himself. With this, I finish and I thank you. Thank you.